Thanks very much, and uh, thanks for the uh, invitation today. I think I, I might start off just sharing one of my earliest memories of, of Chris. I think it was probably the, might have just based on Julia's talk, it might have been the second Australian New Zealand Head and Neck Society meeting. Um, it's probably, the, uh, I was a, a younger oncologist then, and I remember turning up to the meeting, walking down uh, some steps, and there was a big sort of landing where the conference was, meeting room was. And there was Chris, dressed very smartly, as he always was. And I was somewhat taken aback because he was surrounded by reporters and cameras. And I think you just need to remember that the Head and Neck Society was a fledgling society, a small meeting. There was absolutely nothing that you could think of that was media uh, worthy. <laughs> but Chris had reporters and cameras there. But as I got to know Chris a bit better, I, I shouldn't have been surprised because Chris really did have a remarkable uh, ability to uh, advocate for patients with head and neck cancer. And he also, uh, you know, he was, he was a, really a master at uh, promotion and, uh, and lobbying for uh, organisations and causes that he uh, felt passionate and strongly be uh, believed in. And I, the other uh, comment I'd, ma I'd make about Chris is that in his last few years, cl clearly he became very passionate uh, with the concept of a comprehensive cancer centre and, uh, and, and obviously achieving funding for, for LifeHouse. And with that, he, his thinking was aligned with ours at uh, Peter Mac, and we, we had a common interest as we were trying to seek funding for a new centre as well. And I'm, 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 I have no doubt that Chris's effective uh, lobbying and uh, influence with uh, key players, including prime ministers, uh, helped us uh, achieve, also helped us achieve the funding uh, for that build, uh, centre, the building you can see in that picture there. So I'm going to talk to you today about uh, two practice changing trials that I've been fortunate enough uh, to be, uh, to have co-led and be involved in. Uh, these are my uh, disclosures. I'm going to start off talking about uh, a trial in cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. It's obviously a disease which uh, Chris made a major contribution, but I don't uh, I think 10 years ago neither Chris nor any of us could have foreseen uh, some of the changes that were going to happen in oncology and particularly in this disease. And this is a trial with uh, semiplumab, uh, a human monoclonal anti-PD-1 in patients with advanced cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. It's a trial I co-led with Mike Migdon from the MD Anderson. And we know non-melanoma skin cancers are very common. The great majority are cured with surgery, sometimes needing post-operative radiotherapy, as we've heard about. And they really fall into two groups, the patients that are at risk because of chronic UV exposure and the immunosuppressed population. And this is, we know that the incidence of skin cancer is increasing, particularly in the elderly. Um, in Australia, it's estimated that the, the number of deaths due to non-melanoma skin cancer has increased over the years to about 560 a year. And in the US, it's estimated that somewhere between 4,000 and 9,000 uh, deaths uh, per year are due to cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. So in the past, for patients that have, uh, that have exhausted curative options of surgery and radiotherapy, there have been very limited uh, treatment options available. Up until that, previously, there were no approved agents anywhere in the world for cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. The options were chemotherapy or the anti-EGFR agents. And there was a huge unmet need for this, there was an unmet need for this effect, an effective, tolerable therapy. When you go back and look at the chemotherapy literature, it, there's not, it, it's, there's not much of it, and, the, in, and there's some very unusual regimens that were tested or reported on. It's an elderly population, so tolerance of chemotherapy is poor. The response rate may be between 20 and 30 percent, but is generally of short duration. There's a bit of work done with epidermal growth factor receptor inhibitors, and they do have activity. Uh, these studies were mainly done in patients with local regionally rec recurrent disease, uh, not in patients with distant metastases. But you can see response rates ranging from 15 to 30 percent and a median progression free survival of uh, several months. So so the rationale for immunotherapy in cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma is really twofold. It was noted that uh, the tumor mutation burden was very high in cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma, much higher than in other cancers where immunotherapy works, such as melanoma, 
and lung cancer, and you can see head and neck cancer on the left. And of course, the other factor is that it's clearly a disease that occurs in the immunosuppressed, suggesting the importance of the immune system. This is a, another uh, subsequent study uh, showing, looking at tumor mutation burden. And I just draw your attention to the fact that not only uh, the, of the med high median mutations per megabase, but two thirds of the patients have greater than 20 mutations per megabase. That compares to 40% of melanoma, and for head and neck cancer, it's only 10%. So, simiplumab is a high affinity IgG4 uh, monoclonal antibody directed against uh, PD1. It was developed by Regeneron. So Regeneron were pretty late to the party. I mean, obviously, drugs like pembrolizumab and nivolumab were already on the market and, and uh, a proven efficacy in a number of malignancies. But they saw an opportunity in cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma and in consultation with a couple of, a few of us around the world, uh, designed a study to see if uh, they, they could uh, prove efficacy in this indication. And the data I'm going to present to you has been uh, published uh, previously last year in the New England Journal and, and presented at ASCO and updated results at ASCO this year. And so all the results I'm going to present to you are contained in these uh, publications or presentations. You can see from the New England publication there are actually uh, significant Australian involvement with five uh, Australian authors on the list there. The first clue uh, really came from the phase one study where in the dose escalation there was an excellent response in a single patient. And these are, these are the results from an expansion cohort uh, showing a 50% response rate. This led to the phase two study, which now has still ongoing. We're up to group six at the moment. But I'm going to present the results in groups one and two. They had, there is this uh, somewhat, you know, to me, somewhat unusual split in that anyone who had uh, nodal disease was classified as metastatic. So group one was metastatic, which was distant, and or, or nodal, and group two was locally advanced disease uh, without any nodal involvement. And all patients received uh, at that time a milligram, three milligrams per kilogram every 14 days. Subsequently, we've moved to uh, fixed doses and four weekly treatment. Uh, patients had to have good performance status and they had to be immunocompetent. So this was not a study in the immunosuppressed. The median age uh, was uh, 70, this is the group one now, patients with metastatic disease, 59 patients, media age 71. You can see in all of these studies, the uh, oldest patient was 93. Um, so an elderly population, 65% head and neck, and about 77% uh, had distant metastases. About 85% had had prior radiotherapy and 56% prior chemotherapy. And these are the results. Essentially replicating what was seen in a smaller cohort in phase one with a 49% with response rate and very few patients having progressive disease as their first response. In the swimmer's plot here, one, you can see that most of the responses are, are present at the first assessment. And one of the striking things with this drug and this disease is that you see clinical benefit very quickly. You see symptomatic improvement often within the first week or two. Uh, and if your patients have disease that you can uh, palpate, you, you can observe improvement very early. And the responses seem to be durable. So at the, at the last data cutoff, 23 out of the 29 responders remain in response. It, um, it did seem to be, uh, at least numerically, a somewhat lower response rate in the patients that had, had prior systemic therapy, 39% versus 58%. It's a progression-free survival, a median progression-free survival of 18.4 months. And the median overall survival is not reached. And the Captain Meyer estimate of overall survival at 24 months is 71%. And the toxicity was pretty much what you'd expect to see for a single agent anti-PD-1. It was well tolerated. Uh, the, number, <coughs> excuse me, the number of grade uh, three toxicities uh, was low. There were three patients who had uh, a pneumonitis. There were 10 uh, grade... Uh, three immune-related adverse events in eight patients. So turning now to the group two patients, so these are the locally advanced patients. 78 patients, median age again 74, managed to treat a 96-year-old in this study. Um, and you can see 76% of patients are over 65. And as you'd expect in the locally advanced group, 80% were head and neck. 
Interestingly, not many of them had prior chemotherapy, and only 55% had had prior radiotherapy. You had to provide reasons why they could not have a curative surgery or, or curative radiation, and there's a spread of reasons which I'm not going to go through, but obviously if they were deemed to be unresectable, severe disfigurement, um, or if they'd had multiple surgical resections already, and, and curative resection was deemed unlikely for the surgery. And again, similar response rate. So the responses in these studies, it was a registration trial, all were through central review. And you can see here the central review response rate is 44%. The investigator response rate is 53% with fairly strict criteria. But there are many patients with stable disease, deemed to be stable disease, who did very well. And again, only 12% had progressive disease as their best response. So this is summarising the response rates in the, in the three groups. Uh, here, and you can see the durable disease control, which is contrived, is lack of durable disease control, which is lack of progression for at least 105 days, was very similar between the three arms, around uh, 63%. And again, showing uh, the durability of responses, the event-free probability in the locally advanced cohort at 12 months uh, was 88%. There seemed that the response rate in the patients that had multiple uh, surgical procedures was, it, uh, was, a little, was lower, 24%. Obviously, the numbers are small, so that will need to be uh, explored further. We looked at pd one tumour expression and response, and they really, we, we saw activity uh, irrespective of pd one expression. It was perhaps, you know, there really wasn't a clear pattern there. Um, so pd one tumour expression, at least, was not a, a good marker of uh, probability of response in this disease. There was an association with tumour mutation burden. So patient respondents had generally had higher tumour mutation burden than non-responders, 74.2 versus 29%. But you can see there's overlap there, and it, it's not actually clinically useful to predict who will benefit. But in general, there is this correlation when you look at between tumour types, between tumour uh, mutation burden and, and probability of response uh, with cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma up the top right. I'm just going to share a couple of uh, examples uh, with you. Um, this is one of the early patients I treated who, uh, who was in a lot of trouble. He uh, was a 57-year-old man who had rapidly progressive disease, having come off a clinical trial with an epidermal growth factor receptor. He had, had, uh, had a fractured, pathological fracture of the neck of femur, which was, had been fixed, and then he started bleeding from these ulcerated masses in his face. He developed hypercalcemia, and he also had lung metastases. So, as I said, we, he had his neck of femur fixed, he had some, uh, his bleeding, uh, attended to, it seemed to uh, halted with some transexamic acid. He had some treatment for his hypercalcemia. Uh, we deemed him to be ECOG1. We said he, he would still be alive in 12 weeks, which I wasn't actually convinced that was the case, and enrolled him on the study. And uh, he had a, a very quick response. Within a couple of weeks, he was clearly clinically better. And, and then you can see the improvement, uh, uh, and his improvement on his first scan. He had a PET CR. It's got an ongoing CR at 34 months. He's actually not had a scare, any side effects. Um, he's back. Uh, with it, very quickly, he was back doing all his usual activities. And a second example. So this is a, a man with a neglected cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma of the chin. He started uh, treatment on August 2017. Unfortunately, we didn't get a baseline photo. This is a photo in October. So in October, this is, so it's, this is um, two months after he started, he's already responding. So this is, he looked worse than that to start with. This is what he looked like in February 2018. That's what he looked like September 18. That's what he looks like. When, that's what he looked like when I saw him last week. So fairly, and we've got a number, of, there are a lot of cases like this. They're quite remarkable and durable responses. Oops. And that's just showing his pet response. So based on the, this study, semiplumab um, was approved by the FDA in September last year and uh, was approved by the EMA uh, conditional approval in uh, April of this year. 
it, I can't tell you when, you know, this, when it's going to happen in Australia. There'll still be some time before we have uh, certainly t PBS approval. In terms of other immune checkpoint inhibitors and cutaneous SCC, there's not much data available. This is an investigator-initiated study uh, with pembrolizumab showing a 39% response rate. Updated results was presented at ASCO this year. So, so following on, as Sandro's mentioned, we, we did post, now we're going to do uh, C post, so Mipimab post, an adjuvant study. For, and this is actually going to take patient, high-risk patients, so not the same population as in post, and, random, and pa randomised patients that have had surgery and post-operative radiotherapy to semiplumab or uh, placebo. It's a trial run by, uh, through Regeneron in collaboration with uh, TROG, and, uh, which I'm the principal investigator, and Sandro uh, is also on the uh, st steering committee. There's also a similar trial being run by Merck. In terms of future directions, uh, other studies, there's the neoadjuvant studies, there's a lot of interest in exploring further the use as an alternative to surgery where severe disfigurement or dysfunction is expected, interest in combinations. Clearly there's an unmet need in the immunosuppressed and there's a study coming in CLL and obviously the transplant population presents a real challenge. So I'm going to switch gears now and I'm going to talk about uh, mucosal uh, head and neck cancer. You heard a little bit about this in this morning's uh, presentations. So this is Keynote 048. Um, these are the uh, trial that was present, uh, that I presented at ASCO this year. This is a, a randomised, open-label, phase three study that looked at the role of pembrolizumab either as monotherapy or with chemotherapy compared to the extreme regimen for first-line recurrent metastatic head and neck cancer. The extreme regimen had been the standard of care for first-line treatment in most countries for the last 10 years, but has never made it onto the PBS in Australia. The protocol specified its neck and intimate analysis was, intimate analysis was presented by Barbara Burtness at ESMO last year, and uh, the, up, the protocol specified final results, the data cutoff of February, I, will present, I presented at ASCO recently. And I'm going to present a combination of the results from those two analyses today. There are 882 patients randomised in less than two years from 206 sites in 37 countries. So, in Australia, nivolumab is approved, in the US, both pembrolizumab and nivolumab are approved for second line treatment. There is data suggesting that higher PDL1 expression is associated with improved response. And the rationale for giving it with chemotherapy is that chemotherapy may disrupt tumour architecture, may overcome immune exclusion, uh, may result in antigen shedding, and may induce uh, more rapid uh, disease control. So in this trial, patients had to have squamous cell carcinoma of the oral pharynx, oral cavity, hypopharynx or larynx. They had to clearly be incurable to local therapies, good performance status. They had to provide a tissue sample, a tissue sample had to be available for pdl one assessment and they had to have known P16 status if they had oral pharyngeal cancer. The stratification factors were pdl one expression by the tumour expression scores, P16 status and performance status. And the, the, the control arm was extreme as, as published previously and as approved and the experimental arms were pembrolizumab monotherapy and the same chemotherapy in the second experimental arm with pembrolizumab instead of cetuximab. The primary endpoints were overall survival and progression-free survival and there were three populations looked at, two based on pd one expression. The pd one expression was based on what's called the combined positive score. So this is the, the immune and tumour cells that expressed pd one divided by the number of tumour cells times 100. They looked at the patients with scores of greater than 20, greater than 1, and the total population. The secondary uh, endpoints included response rates, quality of life data with, and uh, safety, and duration of response was an exploratory endpoint. But this was a very a simplified version of what was a very, uh, quite a complex statistical plan. But to take you through it, the top row is, were the, prime, the hypotheses that were tested first and in, in parallel. And the hypotheses below the top row were only tested if the hypothesis immediately above it was positive. The, the pre-specified analysis plan allows the alpha from successful hypotheses to be passed to uh, other hypotheses. And the overall alpha was controlled at a one-sided 0 .025 across all comparisons. This analysis uh, was performed about 17 months after the last patient, uh, sorry, 25 months after the last patient was enrolled. 
can see here that the arms were well balanced but for both comparisons. The trial was not designed to compare the two pembrolizumab arms. About 20% of patients had P16 positive oropharyngeal cancer, so predominantly a HPV negative population. About, 20, uh, about 40 to 45% had CPS PDL1 scores greater than 20, and overall 85% were PDL1 positive with CPS scores greater than 1. And about 30% of patients had local regional recurrence without any distant metastasis. So, first of all, looking at the comparison of uh, extreme to the pembrolizumab chemotherapy combination. In, the C, in the patients with high pd one expression, C, CPS greater than or equal to 20, a significant difference was found, P value, a hazard ratio of 0 0.60, p-value of 0.004, and you can see medians of 14.7 versus 11 months, and significant separation at the 24 and 36 months. This is 24 months, you can see 35 versus 19% uh, overall survival. And the CPS greater than or equal to 1, hazard ratio of 0.65, again, highly significant, medians of 13.6 versus 10.4 months. I should say that the extreme regimen behaved in this trial exactly as it did in the original publication, which was pleasing and not something you always see. There seemed to be benefit across all, uh, all the subgroups that, that we looked at. There wasn't a subgroup in which extreme appeared to do better. Progression-free survival, Although the, uh, you can see there the p-value is significant, uh, it was not statistically significant at the superiority threshold of 0 0.0017. But the, there is some separation that you can see there. Response rates were similar between the two regimens, 43 and 38% in the CPS greater than 20, and uh, th about 36% in both arms for CPS greater than 1. And the duration of response was longer in the pembrolizumab chemotherapy combination. And this is the overall survival in the total population, so showing a hazard ratio of 0.77 and uh, statistically significant in medians of 13 versus 10.7 months. Toxicity profiles were similar. Uh, Immune-mediated toxicities of 4.7 versus 8.4%, uh, and uh, treatment-related uh, deaths was 3.6 versus 2.8%. So turning now to the comparison between extreme and pembrolizumab monotherapy. So in the CPS greater than or equal to 20 uh, population, you can see a uh, hazard ratio of 0.61, at p highly significant p-value, and uh, almost 15 months versus 14.9 yeah, versus 10.7 months. And you can see 24 months, 38.3 versus 22.1% uh, remaining alive. CPS greater than 1, also significant, has a ratio of 0.78. You look at progression-free survival, you can see here that the, there, is, there are more early progressors in the uh, pembrolizumab arm and the curves, uh, curves do cross. And this is the overall survival of, of pembrolizumab monotherapy versus uh, extreme. In the first analysis, it was shown to be non-inferior. Um, this analysis, looking for overall survival, the hazard ratio is 0.83, the p-value is 0 0.0199, but it's not statistically significant at the superiority threshold of 0 0.0059. So non-inferior, but not shown to be superior. And this is the progression-free survival in the total population where you can more strikingly see uh, this, uh, the early progressors in the pembrolizumab arm. Response rates lower, 17 versus 36%, but if you get a response to pembrolizumab, it's much more durable than a response to chemotherapy, a median of 22.6 versus 4.5 months. Favourable safety profile, grade 3 to 5, 17 versus 69%. Discontinuations due to uh, treatment-related AEs, 5 versus 20%. And this is just a summary of, of all the hazard ratios from this study. Uh, from the interim analysis and, the, uh, and that's the final analysis. So the summary and conclusions is that pembrolizumab plus platinum and 5-FU versus extreme had showed superior overall survival in all three populations, the pdl one 
positive populations and the total population for longer duration of response and a comparable safety profile. Pembrolizumab monotherapy had superior overall survival in the pd one positive populations, uh, and it was, but it was not superior, but it was not inferior in the total population. It had a substantially longer duration of response and a, very, and a favorable safety profile. So the data supports the incorporation of pembrolizumab um, either as monotherapy or with chemotherapy as part of new first-line standard of care therapy for recurrent metastatic head and neck cancer. And uh, the FDA has uh, recently approved uh, pembrolizumab based on this study uh, for first-line treatment of head and neck cancer. So in conclusion, uh, I think I've de hopefully demonstrated to you that the immune checkpoint inhibitors have very impressive activity in cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma and mucosal head and neck cancer. And based on these trials, sabipolumab in cutaneous and pembrolizumab with or without chemotherapy in head and neck cancer represent a new standard of care for recurrent metastatic disease. And I think the future looks bright with potential to alter treatment paradigms and potentially to show, uh, to, improve, and to improve the outcomes in uh, local regionally advanced disease in the future pending further trials. Thank you.